WWF of the mid-90s has its share of nostalgic thrills, though most look backs to that period can be with minimal fondness. The ill-fated new generation era is bathed in what some consider to be technicolor bile, as it receded on exceedingly gaudy patchwork to try and cover for a glaring dearth of substance. One wrestler lumped in with this indictment of the new generation is Doink the Clown, a living, breathing admission that pro wrestling is in fact a one-ringed circus, complete with its own grease-painted harlequin. It'd be more accurate to say that Doink was a microcosm of WWF at the time, once transcendent and brilliant, but eventually caricatured and lacking in depth. But that's not to say that he didn't leave his mark. I'm Jack from Cultaholic.com and this is Remembering Doink the Clown. The circus officially came to town in the autumn of 1992, and the WWF rolled out a nameless clown during its TV tapings, the first appearance of which, appropriately, aired on Halloween Day. Instead of wrestling, the yet-to-be-named Trickster played pranks on children behind the aisleway guardrail, while forgettable squash matches trudged forth inside the ring. While you might think that Doink's whimsy would detract from the actual wrestling, ask yourself what's more entertaining, Virgil beating a local prelim with a Russian leg sweep, or Doink making a balloon animal for some kid and then immediately popping it with a lit cigar. Yeah, I thought so. The man behind the paint was 14-year veteran Matt Bourne. The second-generation wrestler's career had spanned throughout all the major territories, most notably Portland, Dallas, Mid-Atlantic, and Mid-South. The latter in which he was part of a stable called the Rat Pack, with future WWF stars Ted DiBiase and Jim Duggan. A decorated champion with scores of gritty rivalries in his wake, by mid-92, Bourne was becoming an increasingly forgotten man in WCW, where he was playing a smiling woodsman named Big Josh. Despite receiving considerable visibility when he first donned the flannel, Big Josh began fading away in the spring of 92, and by mid-August, Bourne was gone from WCW at the expiration of his contract. After promoter Jerry Jarrett put in a good word to the WWF on his behalf, Bourne got a couple of tryout matches for the company in September. This wasn't Bourne's first go-around with the WWF, however, as in 1985, he served as a lower-card knockaround guy in Vince McMahon's expanding empire, even losing to Ricky the Dragon Steamboat at the first ever WrestleMania. That first stint might have been completely unmemorable if not for that Mania match, but this time, Bourne was going to leave a much deeper footprint in the foundation of the sports entertainment giant. As Bourne remembers it, shortly after getting hired, he sat down with Vince McMahon and the boss picked his brain, inquiring about his time growing up as the son of veteran wrestler Tony Bourne. During the conversation, the younger Bourne recalled his father's old tag team partner, Lonnie Moondog Maine, who Bourne noted was something of a regular prankster in his day. Soon, Bourne and McMahon were fleshing out the details of what would become the Doink character. The concept of a clown in wrestling seems to predate this meaning, however. Both Bourne and Bruce Pritchard would go on to claim that the idea for a surly, decidedly unfriendly clown was suggested by Road Warrior Hawk sometime earlier, and now McMahon decided to put the curious character into practice. Bourne prepared for the role of a deranged jester by studying Cesar Romero's portrayal of the Joker on the 60s Batman TV series, and admits that he also thought of his dad's old tag partner Lonnie Maine, who had passed away years earlier in a car accident when it came to the character's quirks. As far as Romero's Joker goes, the similarities in each man's bluster and distinctive laughter are evident, but Doink had a more maniacal edge. Though on the surface he trolled young fans through the gleeful employment of mean-spirited pranks, there was to be more nuance. The sudden ceasing of laughter to flash a sullen stare, eyes vacant as he burned a hole into the camera lens, indicated that there may be a real sickness behind Doink's actions. The pranks were seemingly just a cover story for a man doing very little to hide a genuine evil that resided in his heart. In any era of WWE where characters are simplified and presented with broad strokes, this was rare refinement. And this is where criticisms of Doink sometimes fall flat. The occupational gimmicks and hackneyed storytelling of the time are easy targets for ridicule, but this version of Doink simply does not belong in front of that firing line. Perhaps nobody will ever confuse Matt Bourne's portrayal of Doink with Joaquin Phoenix's tormented take on Arthur Fleck, but the same spirit was certainly there. The plumbers, mythological bulls, and jetpack-wearing spacemen of the time were mostly just dudes wearing a costume. Conversely, Bourne embodied Doink, inhabiting the character's split personality with awing aplomb. Unlike with those other unorthodox gimmicks, Bourne had the space and motivation, as well as the approval, to make Doink his own. After spending many weeks picking on fans that couldn't fight back, Doink moved on to the wrestlers themselves. 
Various babyfaces would win their respective squash matches only for Doink to mess with them in the post-match. Be it accidentally stubbing Tatanka in the eye with a mop handle or goading the big boss man into stumbling over a carefully placed tripwire. However, those incidents were one-offs. The interactions between Doink and Babyface X never really led to anything, with one exception. On an episode of WWF Superstars that aired in January of 1993, Crush had just demolished one hapless foe when he encountered Doink in the aisleway. This week, Doink's prop of choice was a rubber ball attached to an elastic band that he could fling at people, before it recoiled back into his hand. As Crush watched Doink send the ball flying into the faces of several children at ringside, the 300-pounder seized the clown, lifting him uncomfortably by his upper arm and calmly telling him to knock it off. Two weeks later, as Crush was polishing off another local yokel, Doink made his way towards ringside, his left arm now in a sling. Showing remorse, Doink apologetically offered Crush a lone flower as something of an olive branch. A wary Crush accepted the conservatory flower, and as he went to leave, didn't realise that behind him, Doink was undoing the sling, showing the damaged arm to be a mere prop. He then smashed Crush in the back of the skull with the object, which was later said to have been filled with batteries and chunks of lead. Doink continued this disquieting assault, a twisted scowl etched on his face as he beat Crush senseless. It was only after a horde of referees pried Doink away from Crush that the clown began merrily laughing again. With that little bit of grim mayhem, Doink was officially acclimated as a wrestler in WWF canon. His first matches in the makeup and green wig aired in late January 1993, feasting on a steady diet of enhancement talent while building to his WrestleMania 9 showdown with Crush. Interestingly, instead of just casting Doink as a malevolent carny, commentators put special emphasis on Bourne's exceptional wrestling ability. Yes, he was a demented individual who got his jollies from making kids cry and hurting people, but damn it, he was also a seasoned technician between the ropes. One school of thought is that maybe McMahon and others were making sure skeptical fans didn't instantly tune out just because there was a literal clown in the ring. By emphasising his wrestling skill, they were legitimising Doink's belonging inside WWF squared circle, heel or not. On the other hand, underlining Doink's in-ring acumen created another dimension for the character. Commentators like Bobby the Brain Heenan pondered whether Doink was simply using the clown motif to gain a psychological edge on his opponents before blinding them with his science. Was Doink a clown that wrestled or was he a wrestler playing 4D chess while armed with a spray bottle of seltzer water? Throughout 93, the many sides of Doink were visible in higher profile matches. He wound up defeating Crush at WrestleMania 9 with the aid of a doppelganger, played by Steve Kern, the former Skinner, with whom he shared an amusing man in the mirror routine over a prone Crush's body. As far as master technician Doink goes, look no further than Monday Night Raw in 1993 to see some of Matt Bourne's finest works. A King of the Ring qualifier with Mr. Perfect, a two out of three falls epic with Marty Jannetty, and a heated battle with Macho Man Randy Savage all underscore the brilliance of Bourne the Wrestler, as he deftly blended technique with overt character acting, revealing him to be an immensely well-rounded performer. Shortly after wrestling Bret Hart at the 93 SummerSlam, the very concept of Doink took a pie to the face. It was right after this pay-per-view that WWF pivoted on its toes and spun Doink in a different direction. He was being turned babyface. Doink went on to humiliate Heenan and Jerry Lawler in different TV segments that aired in September. His theme music was changed going from a rather unsettling violin laced with cackling laughter to a sugary in-house rendition of Entry of the Gladiators, which most would recognise as traditional circus music. Bourne believes that Doink's face turn was a result of his real-life substance issues, which he admits were out of control at the time. While feuding with looming villain Bam Bam Bigelow, Doink was maintaining only a small semblance of his prior edge, with none of the preceding darkness evident. As it turned out, Bourne wasn't long for the company anyway. He was fired somewhere around the 93 Survivor Series, the apparent result of Bourne openly smoking pot in a hotel hallway, which he claims Bam Bam told management about. Bourne had previously been suspended in September, at which time the Brooklyn Brawler played the role of Doink at house shows. Following Bourne's departure, the role went to veteran grappler Ray Apollo whose biggest claim to fame had previously been playing the role of a South African apartheidist at the 1990 Starcade. Hmm, what a gimmick that was. Apollo wasn't the only one donning the colourful Doink getup, however. At the 93 Survivor Series, Bigelow captained a quartet of baddies to face four Doinks, who ended up being the Bushwhackers and the Men on a Mission in Doink wigs and paint. The match veered away from the twisted hijinks and mind games of the Bourne era Doink, instead embracing the overtly cartoonish silliness that would come to define Doink going forward. And this new Doink wouldn't be alone. Following the Survivor Series shenanigans, he began accompanying himself with his own mini-me, a pint-sized clown named Dink. Come 94, the Doink act was even more heavily sanitised, reduced entirely to broader humour that would never constitute nightmare material, while Vince would be the first to yuck it up on commentary. There was now nothing edgy or inventive about this Doink, as he and Dink, smiling all the while, did their best to get the goat of heels like Bigelow, Jeff Jarrett and Jerry Lawler. 
Even his finishing move, a flying seated senton known as the whoopee cushion, was made sillier thanks to the dubbed sound effect of, you know, an actual whoopee cushion whenever he landed the move. If you've ever shared a home with someone that hated wrestling and thought it was the stupidest form of entertainment on earth, you prayed they wouldn't enter the room during one of Doink's matches, especially during the finish. While Apollo and WWF pressed on with this more straightforward portrayal of a happy clown, Vaughn continued to play his Doink role in other promotions. He turned up in the increasingly influential ECW, in which he took on the name Born Again, wearing only some of the Doink makeup while portraying an unresolved anger towards the WWF for casting him as a cartoon character. He took said anger out on his opponents, dressing them in doink accessories after the match as a means of humiliating them. He didn't stay in ECW long, however, and Bourne soon left to tour other small promotions, oftentimes working as doink, minus the put on contempt. Back in WWF, the culmination of doink as a pushed superstar came at the 1994 Survivor Series, where he captained a team of three miniature sidekicks named Dink, Wink, and Pink to face Lawler and three short royals named, uh, Queasy, Sleazy, and Cheesy. Following that debacle, which ended with, what else, an actual pie to the face, Doink began plummeting down the card. Mostly, he and Dink were put to use at the company's charitable endeavours, particularly those involving children, but otherwise, the character was beyond stale. By September of 1995, the tent folded up on Doink as a WWF wrestler, as he lost to the likes of Waylon Mercy, Dean Douglas, and Hunter Hearst Helmsley on the way out. Since then, Doink has made sporadic appearances in WWE, be it pay-per-view one-offs or Legends-themed TV appearances or even, as the Ayatollah of Rock and Roller, in disguise. These versions of Doink generally adhere to the 1993 face turn, distilled down to the simple elements of the good-natured clown he'd become. The role has also been played by numerous people on the independent scene throughout the decades, including former WWF enhancement talent Dusty Wolf. As for Doink's infamous skirmish with Heidenreich outside of a Golden Corral, well, let's just say those weren't the golden days of the Doinkster. Younger fans would be forgiven if all they knew Doink as was the friendly, bozo-like character that made simpletons of the bad guys because that's how he's been portrayed for the last 25 plus years, with extremely few exceptions. And that's really been the source of a lot of contemporary criticism towards Doink. The shallow version of him is seen as the embodiment of a wrestling industry that revels far too much in simple ha-ha comedy. When you're demonizing wrestling as a circus, who do you point the accusing finger at? The literal clown, obviously, that too. As you've seen here though, that criticism hasn't always been valid. At one time, Doink the Clown was a breath of fresh air, even if some traditional-minded viewers were willing to flunk him on sight just because of what he was. The nuance and depth given to the character by Bourne is what some older fans prefer to remember Doink for the most, and he still wrestled as Doink as late as June of 2013, weeks before his sad death at the age of 55. He was at his best as the sort of deliciously evil sociopath that springs from comic books and horror movies. Doink the Clown has been both brilliant and boorish, masterful and mind-numbing, tremendous and tedious. He is utterly unforgettable, but what he is remembered for is very much in the eye of the beholder. That kind of mixed legacy has assured the Doink character a permanent place in the history of pro wrestling, the patron saint of a business gone wrong or a lasting tribute to a twisted imagination set free to roam.